G'day guys, Chris Dorry here, and today I have Jords from Jords Supercoach. G'day, Jords. Hi, Chris. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, so today I've challenged Jords to a game of chess, and I'm pretty keen at the same time to learn some more advanced Supercoach hints and tricks. Tricks. So, yeah, I'm pretty keen for this, and um, yeah, so let's get started, and hopefully this game works for us. And just before you start, there's a bit of an ELO differential between us two. Yeah. Um, you're a lot better than I am, but uh, I'll give it my best and maybe go, go a little easy on me to make it interesting, I reckon. Yeah, yeah, we'll see what happens. Yep, so white to move. Yeah, excellent. Okay, so let's start with some questions. So uh, should I, I'll, I'll play E4. I was considering the Sicilian defense, but I'll play E4. Okay, so question one. So as a super coach coach, what do you consider to be your point of difference? So. Good question, Chris. Um, probably I would say two things. I think one, I put a lot more time into other people. So I do have the time, or at least I make the time. And another one would be how I approach the buy rounds. So in the buy rounds, I load up in the first buy round on plays and I take a hit and say this year, I think it's round 11. I'll take a hit in round 11, suffer a little bit in the points in the ranks. But then um, the next two rounds, I'll be fine. So I'll excel really well. And I see the buys as an opportunity rather than something to fear. So that's my strategy. I think I haven't really heard anyone do that sort of stuff. So um, yeah, that's my strategy. That's my point of difference, I think, how I approach the buy rounds. Fantastic. And your first picked player for season 2021. So who's the one must absolute have player in your opinion? So, uh, not negotiable is Brody Grundy. Brody Grundy. Okay. So, so you'll get back to it. Yeah. So yeah, I've definitely, definitely got in my team as well. Yeah, definitely get Brody Grundy. I've seen, I had an argument on Twitter with a few people today. It's just not worth the risk going without him. Hmm. Yeah, and I guess you've got the Max Lynch factor. Maybe he absorbed some minutes, but I agree. I think he's underpriced. He's very durable historically. So he was my first pick premium as well, honestly. So I think he fits well there. Do you feel like the high endurance running types will have a better 2021 season with longer quarters? And will those more fast twitch power athletes drop off this year in your mind? It's an interesting question because it's a little hard to tell because some just because a player has really good endurance doesn't always mean they're going to score and play well. But for players like Andrew Gaff and Lockie Neal, who were playing really high time on ground um, last season, even though they have more endurance, the time on ground might drop back a bit because they were playing, I think Neal was low 90s and Gaff was high 90s. Um, so I'm not sure it's going to be too much of an issue. I think the main thing is with Christian Petrarca is when the players we had question marks over over their tank that did really well in twenty in twenty twenty. Um, we need to kind of figure out have they got the endurance for full length games. So more in that regard. So I don't think the endurance matters uh, too much because a lot of the proven guys kind of already have it anyway. So it's more or less trying to figure out those from twenty twenty are they going to convert over to twenty twenty one. So I don't think it's a big deal, no. Okay, fantastic. And in your mind, what is, what's the minimum number of captain options for super coach in season 2021 that a team should start a season with? I think we, in this current year of super coach, in previous years, we had limited options and it meant that more errors were happening. Mm. Um, but I think right now we have a lot of options in the midfield. And if there's less, um, if there's a lot of midfield rookies, we could go less in the midfield, but it kind of depends on how the season or how the opening teams pan out. So I would go with four. So Gorn and Grundy, and then two in the midfield. Jake Lloyd could be passable, and I don't think anyone in the forward line will pass. Um, Okay, so not a Dunkley or Danger, or you just think they're probably a bit inconsistent for you? So they're just not, not, not at his age. Danger's variation of scoring, it's, it seems to be, yeah, 
it's a few high scores and a few lowish ones, still gets tagged every now and then. Um, might be because he's older, he has declines. But when he, when a guy's averaging, I don't know, low 110s, he's not really an ideal captain option. Uh, when you have Boyle and Grundy there. So maybe a fallback, but I would go with four. And I'm not, yeah, I don't think, I wouldn't bank on Dangerfield as a captain option. He could give you some scores, but it's higher risk. Mm. Yeah, and I tend to agree at this point as well there. Okay, so um, how much of a must is a permanent captain loophole in your mind? Is it something you advise oh. most people have or what's your feel there? Yes, you need captain loophole because there's a lot of points up for grabs here. What's interesting this year is that we have a R3 that is playing so what do we do with the loopholes? Like, do we put in a ruck forward at F8? Um, it's hard to tell. So ideally, get a ruck forward at F8 as your floating donut. But the problem with that is you kind of leave your bench a little bit exposed. Especially this year, there's a few injury-prone players like Danaher, um, Dow's had injuries that we might be starting in the forward line. So I think you need to find a way to get a loophole in rather than guessing captains. Maybe someone gets dropped in round two, who knows, but maybe they don't. I think the strategy this year is, to, for this year specifically, predict a defense donut and use them as your loophole until you can bring a proper loophole in and hopefully they play again after. One of the reasons for this is there's very little options in defense, you know, very little rookie options in defense. So the answer to the question is yes, you need a loophole, and unfortunately, this year it's going to be difficult. In other years, it won't be as difficult. Um, but yeah, you need one. And I think this year, the best bet is to predict a donut, uh, to start a donut in defense and predict someone that'll play. Like maybe Will, Will Gould should play this year. So yeah, that's that's what I think. For someone who might be introduced into the team maybe a bit later on, perhaps might be a safe way to do it. So. Mm, okay. yeah. Excellent. But yeah, obviously, ideally, you go for the F... F um, the FA or uh, R3 donut, but this year it's a little different. Okay. Oh, excellent. And is there a certain average score you look for to determine if someone is a worthwhile captain option while we're on the subject of captains? Yeah, good question. I prefer to play it safe. So, you know, there's, I remember last year I took 115 odd from Grundy, and people were like, nah, that's not enough. And then I think Gorn went 160. So I was like, ah, oh, I guess wrong, wrong call. But then other weeks, there was a week where I think I took a safer option. I took a safer captain from somebody else. And then Lockie Neal scored like 70 or 60 or something like that. So you win some, you lose some. I am conservative. So I think probably 115 to 120 is acceptable. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, it depends on how aggressive you want to be. So yeah, I'd rather not, you know, you can, you can go up from 115, like you generally, like an average captain, say Gorn is your, your captain and he's averaging 130, he's probably going to give you 130. But sometimes players can get injured, they can have bad games. And while it's uncommon, it can happen and it punishes you really hard. So I'm very risk averse and I'll take a lowish captain score. Yeah, and what about awesome. vice captains? Because that actually makes me think about that. So what would be an acceptable vice captain score where you'd be thinking, I'll take that vice captain score that's sort of at a level where I don't think the captain will be likely to beat that. Is there a particular level for you with that as well? I think it's the same, 115, 120. About 115, 120. It, it, it kind of depends. Like if Gorn is coming up against a second, like a VFL Ruckman, then, yeah, just don't worry about the 115 and go with Gorn. Um, but otherwise, yeah, you got to watch Ruck matchups. Um, sometimes midfielder matchups don't always go the way you do, but Ruck matchups are more predictable. Okay. So, yeah, it depends on the situation, but most of the time I will take the 115, 120, even though that is on the lower end. And this is my projection, but I'm thinking of Max Dorn and Lockie Neal. They may drop their average by about 10 to 15 points per game. Should we start them knowing they pose, even if that were to occur, sort of still a pretty decent captain option and would be, again, sort of in the mix, I guess, by position to be one of the highest scorers in their respective positions? 
or should we wait to trade them in a bit later when their prices drop, assuming that that projection works out to be the case? Uh, it's a difficult question, but I can answer it. So my view is you have to weigh up alternatives, right? So in the RUC, the alternatives are, a lot of them are a bit iffy. So, oh, that was a good move, by the way. Um, so with Gorn, like, who are your alternatives? I'm not really sure. you got Grundy, but you probably already have Grundy. Um, so, and then when you're trying to get Gorn or Grundy in, because you know they're the plays you have to get in, like, as, as soon as possible, then you leave it to chance and you leave it to timing to bring him in. So, you know, you might need a, your R2 might be ready to trade out, but Grundy or Gorn might be 700K and you can't get to them without using three or four trades. It's a, not an ideal situation. So even though Gorn is overpriced, I highly recommend starting Max Gorn. Now, Lockheed Neal is a little bit different and I'm not, I don't think I'll start Lockheed Neal this year. Um, and I'm a little bit scared to be honest, but he was probably more inflated than Max Gorn because he had a lot more time on grounds. Um, and he's had an interrupted preseason this year. So for me, Lockie Neal, I think you can go without. And, you know, he might get tagged out of a game, whereas Gorn doesn't really have bad, bad games. Maybe against Nick Nat, he struggles a little bit. So for me, I think there's a case that, that you don't have to start Lockie Neal. I think he has to average um, 140 on to maintain his price. So you get him cheaper, it's going to be a pain getting him in. But you don't have to bring him in as soon as possible, although it's ideal. When you're upgrading your midfield, you got a whole range of options. Whereas in the rucks, it's only going that you're going to be waiting for. So to answer, so yeah, to recap, you have to start Gorn in my opinion. And Neil, you can go without, although it might not be pretty at times. And did you find Neil was copying the tag most to Brisbane last year, or was it still Zorko who was copying that tag? Because that might be a component to the scoring as well. Do you have much of a feel from oh. Brisbane games and who was tagging most? So I'm just thinking, like, I, I know think Neil started getting Neil started yeah. really dropped off, so maybe he got the tag more. I'm not too sure there, but that was. I mean, going fun. into the season, it was kind of 50 50 because. As, as good as Neil was, Zorko was the one who was susceptible to tags. Hmm. It'll be lucky Neil that gets tags now. And yeah, maybe with Luggage or Rainer goes through the midfield, they probably won't get tagged just yet. But I wouldn't be too worried with them. Um, oh, I mean, uh, Neil will get tagged so um, over Zorko. So yeah, uh, tagging, I'm not sure I consider tagging too much. When, with starting picks because it's 22 rounds there's going to be a lot of games that don't get tagged and it's hard to time bringing in players when they're going to get tagged so I wouldn't worry too much about it so he will get tagged more than Zorko and I should mention in this position you can save your knight so for a little bit of a thing I, I don't see it if you bring the bishop back you can bring another protector oh, oh no, that was a wrong move someone, yeah yeah, had you gone bishop back to e2, that would have saved you there. Yeah. Okay. I'll ponder through my best move here. But for the purposes of a starting team, how overpriced is too overpriced for a premium? Does this number change in your mind if it's a captain option or is it just a pretty sort of standard across the board sort of rule in your mind? Um... Yes, it does change. It's a captain option. I mean, ideally, the, the midfielders are harder to bring in. They're going to be more expensive. So you have to draw a line somewhere because you pick all overpriced players, then the rest of your team's going to suffer. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of value built into that premium selection with durability, role, you know, reliability, because you know they're not going to fail. Um, so... Yeah, I think it does matter the um, if they're a captain option or not, but paying overs for quite a few players is okay. I'm not sure if you can put a price on it. Um, say maybe five to seven points of a price, I still think that's okay to start a player like that. And just because of the other, the value they bring elsewhere. Um, but yeah. 
Yeah, no, that's a good deal there. So you don't be afraid to spend a little bit on this. Hmm. Okay. No, that's really good insight there. And how essential in your mind is it to have the top six defenders, top six forwards, top eight mids, top two rucks? And I guess there, how much give is there to have someone a bit below that in your final team? And how many, I suppose, of those who are below that would be reasonable or possible if you really wanted a competitive contending team for an overall prize? So in the, guess, back, in the, the back end of this season is um, it's quite long. Mm. So you'd want close to the perfect team, but you can make up a lot of ground earlier in the season if you pick like a, a 500k player in the midfield that averages lower hundreds. That's acceptable um, because you, you save money there so you um, boost the power of your team elsewhere and got those extra points early. So I think there's a little bit of give maybe more so in the forward and back line. Um, as the seasons go on in the midfield, there seems to be more uber premiums. So like 115 plus guys within every year. So it's a little bit more punishing in the midfield. Whereas if you look at the defense line this year, there's a whole bunch of players that'll go um, probably around flat 100. Maybe, maybe, maybe less, maybe more, I'm not sure. But I'm seeing a lot of guys that could be around the mark. So it's a little bit more forgiving in defense. Uh, not so much in the midfield. Um, but yeah, that's my answer to that. And by when should I be aiming to complete a full field with the top scorers by? So like if I'm to, I guess, hope to contend for an overall prize, when should I have that, I guess, complete team? I would, it depends on the year because things are getting more expensive every year. Um, But I would say a week after the buys, ideally. Hmm. And you know, this year we might have to start less less keepers, so it might take two weeks after the buy rounds, um, just because of, we don't know the rookie situation this year. So maybe we have to go an extra mid price or something like that. So yeah, um, and after the somewhere close to after the buys. Okay. Oh, that's a good sort of guide there. If you can finish it in the, in the, within the buys, great. But, um, because of the buy around, some places of buys, you not might you not you might not always get the plays you want to get in. So probably aim for a week or two after the buy rounds. Okay, oh, excellent. And who are the five must-have premiums to start season twenty twenty one in your mind? Oh. If you said you absolutely have to, I guess have them. Okay, number one is not even close. It's Brody Grundy. Mm. Number two is gone because of the alternative options and the fact that he's the first captain option, even though he's overpriced. Gorn's fixture early is a bit of a piss take as well. He plays, I think, the first three teams he plays, the first choice Ruckman are missing in all three teams. Mm. Um, next I'll say is Rory Led, and he didn't play too well in the preseason game against Port. But he showed fantastic ability to win the ball um, last year when playing in the midfield. And he averaged about 115, one yeah. almost maybe 117, something like that in the midfield. So played really well. Um, yeah, and I noticed with Laird, like when I watched him in the first half of the season, in defence, he just looked lost. His skills, decision-making just weren't there. But then when he went into the midfield, he looked really good. So it seems to be with him all about that role at the moment. So... Um, but yeah, yeah. He's playing midfield, yeah, I tend to agree. What about are there two others for you? So you mentioned Grundy. So Grundy. I know the fourth one, it's Jake Lloyd, and I know you have a slightly differing opinion on this. And I'm actually considering him for selection, honestly. Like, I, he might be another a bit like that walking Neil Max Gorn, where I think he might drop back a little, but not necessarily by too, too much. So it could be seven, yeah, eight, yeah. up to ten. I don't know. It is possible that, um, Lloyd loses a few kickouts if they want to use Campbell or Gould either. I'm um, not, not exactly sure. John Longmire has favoured um, favored Lloyd for a long time now. So I think Lloyd, Lloyd is very difficult to trade in as well. It's, it's just 120, 120, 120, well, 100 to 120 scores every week. It just makes it very difficult to bring him in. Might take an extra trade. Yeah. So those are the clear four, and I don't think it's close for, for fifth. Hmm. I'm not even sure I had a fifth. Originally, it was Josh Dunkley, 
but I'm a little bit worried about Beveridge and the fact that he wanted to leave. Yeah. If I had to say another one, um, maybe is there a mid Clayton, Clayton Oliver? Clayton Oliver, yeah, because he's got the durability over time. Do you think he'll maintain that average though? Because he had, I think it was about a 114, 108 then into the one sort of 22-ish, 123-ish range last year. So could he do that again or is he going to be another who drops back a few? And that's what I'm finding with all of them is I think they're all going to drop back somewhat. But yeah, how much? I don't know. Uh, so Clayton Oliver. Yeah. Well, here's the thing with Oliver. He improved. So what I noticed is when he was playing, I think they even showed this on Fox footy, is that he was rushing his disposal when he was getting the ball in the stoppages. So what he started doing about a third away through the year is he was like pausing, kind of dancing around the stoppage. You know, instead of throwing on the boot, he was kind of giving himself a bit more time to make a decision to um, what to do with the ball. His disposal efficiency went up. He went from like a, I think it was 110-ish or in the hundreds to almost got to 130 average at one point. And I think finished the year at 120 something. So I think we'll see between, I think there will be a drop, but I think that'll be not a whole lot. I think it'll be upwards of 115 that will score. Um, it's a little hard to tell because everyone is kind of going to drop back by default. But I think Oliver will be right up there. I have him in his top three. Yeah, I watched him in the preseason game and he looked phenomenal, as he always does. Yeah, because I heard, I think there was he was having some injury issues or he was coming back from something. So, yeah, it's great. Yeah, he had shoulder surgery, but he looks fine, I think. Oh, fantastic. Not off-season. Yeah. Just, a, I think, a clean-out. I don't think it was a reconstruction, but um, okay. not, not sure. I could be wrong on that one. But what I liked with him, like he was giving, I found, I found a bit more burst out of stoppages last year. And he was just taking yeah. on the game a bit more aggressively. And that's what I liked. Whereas in the past, he probably wasn't quite doing that as much. So, um, yeah, his game's definitely grown. Same with Tracker, really. So, yeah, that Melbourne midfield's gotten quite a bit better. Um, what in your view on, I guess, a, well, what's your view of a 100% Guns and Rookies team for Supercoach? Is it viable? Is it recommended? Or is it only suitable for particular years? What's your feel there? So I just realized it was my turn. Anyway, yeah. um, guns, guns and Rookies. In a perfect world, we go all Guns and Rookies. But unfortunately, things don't happen. Maybe, you know, I was looking at something I did the other day um, when I was looking at the winning teams. So it was a winning, four winning teams over the past 10 years. I couldn't find the other ones. And I believe it was nine out of 10 of their mid prices failed. So generally, mid prices do fail, and with mid prices, they have to tick a lot of boxes, whether it's durability, role, job security. Um, they need to ideally have some evidence of scoring in that role. Um, so you can go a few mid prices if there's no rookies, and what else, what's the alternative really? Uh, maybe you have to sacrifice the mid midfield uh, premiums and turn it into less of other premiums uh, in defence in the forward line, um, so you can pay up for rookies, but. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, you definitely want to pay up for rookies. Don't skimp on rookies because every single rookie is important. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's viable. I wouldn't go too many mid prices. Um, but yeah, pay up for rookies and try and go as guns and rookies as you can. And then, depending on if there's no rookies, add in maybe one or two mid prices and pay up for rookies that way. So yeah, start off with guns and rookies and then kind of drop back a little bit with your team, depending on if there's. Uh, the quality and what rookies are actually available. Okay. And from that research as well, just on that question as well, were you finding that it was mostly, was it breakout contenders, guys coming back from injuries? What sort of mid-prices were predominantly failing that were, I guess, in those eventual winning teams? That might be instructive as well if you've seen through some of those. Okay, I just misclicked, by the way, but that's fine. Um, oh, is there so a take back on your end? If not, don't worry. I don't worry about it. Um, so, like, types of mid-prices? Yeah, so um, types of being missing have you found? Like, on those winning teams, like you mentioned, there are a lot of failures from those teams. Were they mostly, were they breakout contenders? Were they guys coming back from injuries that were just injury-prone? Or, I guess, what types of mid-prices did you find from those teams were, I guess, failing with regularity? A lot of the players had, they didn't have the right role. Mm. Um, so I'm looking actually got it in front of me so I think one year they picked Paul Manhurst and Barry Hall for mid prices and this is a guy that won by the way 
Um, so they, they didn't really have the midfield role. Um, one see one player picked uh, one person picked Travis Cloak when he won the Coleman. I think and that worked out fine. And then some players are just not in the right age bracket. So I think there's one someone picked Brad Crouch when he was very very young for three hundred odd k, and it didn't really work out. Um, but yeah, it's uh, the t when looking at mid prices again, as I said before, they need to tick all the boxes, and the ones that are more likely are the fallen premiums. And the ones that are having a role change or you know getting more center bounce attendances um, is probably the main indicator. So uh, for example, Dyson Heppel sort of a, used to be a premium or a sub-premium. Now he's uh, come back um, from injury and he's 300 k But he's having a different role at halfback, but he still has a super good filling role. So I expect him to be an okay pick, probably a low upside pick, but you know, probably one with not much downside. Um, but yeah, I think when looking at your mid prices, the one the breakout picks are really really hard. But you just want to make sure something is changing. You know what the the reason for them being a mid price is because something has gone wrong. Um, for them to not be a premium, whether that be unproven, not in the right age bracket, or, or whatever. So definitely the ones that are having a role change or more mid time, um, and making sure that the talent is there as well. Yeah, no, oh, interesting. And is there a benchmark? Okay, so, yep, some up to here. Is there a benchmark expectation for a rookie to be viable to start on the field? And does this differ by position? Do you mean in terms of just scoring? Um, yeah, so in terms of, like, I guess what they would average. Like, is there a particular average that you'd be expecting in, like, each respective position to be worth starting on the field? Or... I guess, what would you be looking for there to, I guess, feel inclined? So, like, say as an example, you might decide a Tom Powell you might be considering to start on the field. Like, I guess to be worthwhile starting on the field, what would someone like that need to average to be favourable over, as an example, a mid-price? Or do you sort of get what I'm getting up there? So, like, I guess you'd have yeah. to have a certain number of rookies to start on your field. Um, yeah. How do you sort of determine, I guess, that their price point is acceptable to be worth starting on the field? Is there like a particular number you really hope for? Or Numbers are generally, for me, uh, generally work with ballpark numbers. So um, for rookies, like you just kind of want 50 to 60. Um, for if you're paying up for rookies, so Powell's a bit more, for example, I don't think it changes what you really want for them. Maybe when they get in the 200k range. Um, yeah, I, I'm more, I, I just look for job security. Um, with job security, you've got to assess what other players are knocking on the door. Um, durability is not that important, but um, for say for more expensive players, so say a 200K player, you probably want 70, 250, 75, um, 300, probably 80 to 85, especially in the midfield. In the midfield, you want a bit more from mid prices. Um, and then 350, 350 is like the borderline between stepping stone and keeper. And you probably want them to be a keeper, to be honest. So probably you want 95 for a 350K player. Did that answer the question right? Yeah, no, fairly well, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it's just, I guess, to get a feel. And I guess, is there any difference by position as well? So, like, obviously, with midfielders, you expect more. Do you expect, say, is it 10 points per game more if you're going to start a midfield rookie? Is it five compared to, I guess, say, a forward or back? Is there much of a difference there by position as well? In terms of base rookies, not really. Okay. You just want them to score. Yep. Um, but... Again, maybe it affects your structure a bit if there's better quality rookies elsewhere. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't sacrifice, make too much sacrifice for your premiums to make way for rookies because then you can compromise on premiums, which has a can be pretty brutal long term. Um, but yeah, in terms of different, uh, um, what's it called? Different uh, expectations for rookies in different lines? Not really, not, not at a base price. Tonight. 
And what's your view on the viability of a structure that includes two rookie rucks? So obviously you're a fan of the Grundy Gorn combination, but is there any sort of viability in doing that? Because I can see possibly three or four rookies that might even be in the mix for round one that are in the ruck line and rucks tend to score pretty well. So is that something okay. to consider possibly? So this was spoken about, I spoke to someone on Twitter, or a few people on Twitter about this today. Mm. And they're looking at, at they're looking at it from a points point of view. And it's a lot more than just points with these players. So we're saying, oh, you know, maybe you get plus five points here, plus 10 points here. Um, uh, not a bit of trouble here, that's all right. Um, yeah, from the forks. So that was the forks. Yeah. Um, so here's the thing the backfire potential. Okay, first and foremost, we are in right now, 2021, we are in an era with two of the best Ruckmen, dare I say, of all time. I'm not, maybe I need to look up my history a little bit more. In terms of super coach, at least, they're the two best Ruckmen of all time. In terms of scoring, definitely, I would agree. Um, Gorn's had slight durability issues, but I think he only misses a couple of games, so it's not too bad. Um, but the captain options, the captain scores he provides are pretty huge. Um, yeah. So what would I guess say as an example of Flynn for GWS? What would he have to average to, I guess, make you think about that? So probably like, like 75, I reckon. Number one ruck. Probably about 75. Um, but again, what I was going to say before is as much as like you can you can probably win on points, but the consequences of not not starting Gorn um, and Grundy going down to a base a base um, Ruckman or even a mid price Ruckman, um, it can get pretty pretty ugly. So for example, what happens if Lynn gets dropped? Like you're kind of screwed. You have to cop a donut. Um, because I think it was said somewhere that you know, Mummy might chop him out every few weeks um, just to see how he goes. His numbers weren't even that good, I don't think, in the meeple from memory. Yeah. Um, so things can go wrong. In the things that can go wrong, um, they punish you really hard and they probably ruin the season. You know, I'm a big, a big fan of leaving things, not leaving things to chance if possible, and you know, not leaving them to timing. So yeah, what if Gorn? Yeah, what if, I think I said it before. What if Grundy's 700 and your ruck is only 300 and he has to have a spell? Like, what do you do? You, you're kind of stuck. Are you really, so yeah, my views, you don't want to be in that scenario. In an era of not Gorn and Grundy, there's a better case for it, but not with these two that are, you know, showing no signs of, showing no signs of slowing down. Gorn's probably 30 next year, I think, so it'll make things interesting, but he's looking right to go still 29, I think, this year. So 30 in December, so yeah. I think yeah, it's not conceivable yeah. there are passes there, I think, so. Yeah. Yeah, not, in the, not in the era. Don't, don't play with it in the era of Gordon Grundy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, great response there. Oh, good game. Good game. So I'll go Rena. So I'll keep going with these questions. Yes. So what are the conditions in your mind for a mid-pricer to be viable? Do they need to average over a certain number? Or do they need to be, I guess, a certain number underpriced in your mind? So is it about uh, they need to average something or do they need to be underpriced a certain amount? Because obviously it's about guns and rookies in Supercoach overall. I guess you got to try and figure out what you want out of the rookie, what, what you want out of the mid-price at first. So do you want a... Um, do you want a stepping stone? Do you want a keeper? So if you want a stepping stone, then the expectations are a little bit lower. Um, if you want a keeper, um, in terms of scoring, probably want 90, 90 in the forwards or defense is absolutely worse. And in the midfield, probably 100-ish, I think. Um, but yeah, again, as I've said a few times, um, it's, uh, it's a lot more than just points. Um, so... Yeah, probably 90 for forwards and defenders and then probably like 95 to 100 in the midfield. I guess it depends on the strength of the year as well. So, And say, would yeah, you include, so as an example, say a Z-ball in that? Is it like, where do you draw the line with mid-prices? Is it like, say, if they're 
250k plus, or I guess where would that expectation of say okay. 90 across those land those lines start roughly? Oh, game of board. Oh, let's start again. Yeah. Yep, so, yep, so, so in terms of drawing the line, so I took too long there. Yeah. Um, I don't think you have to draw the line. Okay. Um, no, it's, it's hard to say because it just depends on the strength of the rookies. Um, you might be forced to pay up, but here's the thing. Zeeble's probably not a keeper, right? And another thing with Zeeble, uh, do we even know if he's going to score well at halfback? Just because he's has a super good friendly role doesn't mean he's going to score well, but... Um, that's just an example for Zebul anyway. Yeah. Uh, I think the thing with Zebul, you, you treat him as, an, a, as a very expensive rookie that you have the luxury of keeping on the field for as long as you want. So I think you probably look at, look at it from the perspective of how many keepers do I have and how the mid prices are affecting that to kind of reverse engineer that question. Mm. So... Uh, Um, so yeah, I would try, try and get to, depends on the strength of the year as well, try and get to 12 keepers, 13 if you're good, but I think this year feels like a 12 keepers, um, because there's, from one of, from the winning teams that I saw, they had uh, between 15 and 12 keepers, 11 possibly, but it feels a little risky, um, and then see how many mid prices fit into that. Yeah. And this year, it seems just a phenomenal year for mid prices as well, that's why I guess they're so curious there. Um, and in your mind, what's the greatest risk with selecting mid prices? Is it injury, scoring, role, job security? And I guess, how do you weigh these risks to determine if they're worth their price? With mid prices, they kind of need to tick all the boxes. In terms of the most important, um, role is really important. For example, you pick Jack Lukosius, right? And he's playing unbelievable in a halfback. Uh, um, like third toll in defense. Round one, he's playing forward. Um, so that's why I can't pick Lukosius as, as much as I like him and think he'll score well this year. The risk of him going forward means you have to trade him out because he's going to score significantly less in a super coach, in a less super coach friendly role. Um, so role is probably up there. But durability, maybe a little bit more lenient because. Um, you know, you can kind of get away with um, durability sometimes. But still, durability is very important and something I consider heavily. Um, in terms of points, you give a bit of leeway to points. So obviously you want them to not completely bust. And you know, having the friendly role, that's where you check the role first. That should take care of the points somewhat. Um, so durability role, uh, job, job security as well. They need to have job security. That's probably the most important. Um, so yeah, I think the yeah I think role role job security probably are two most important. All right, so but you want to tick all the boxes. Okay. Yeah, and then from here, we've sort of answered this one already. That it's sort of I guess how high the mid prices need to score, or is it more about cash generation and achieving? I guess, cash generation greater than rookies? Like, do you look for greater cash generation than with rookies in mid-prices or similar? Is that sort of, I guess, something that helps there too in determining their viability? Oh, my God. Yeah. Definitely. Had to go to um, King to E7 there to save the queen. Yeah. I knew that. Yeah, it seemed to obviously be true. Um. Like, I guess, is... In terms of cash generation... Yeah, go on. So in terms of cash generation, um, I guess it depends. I think with mid-prices, the value in mid-prices, right, you, you, or expensive rookies, is, well, they have more job security. They're probably going to score more points, although that balances out with the rest of your team. Um, and you can keep them on the field for as long as you want. It gives you the flexibility. You know, I don't have to trade them out week eight. Even if their break even is a bit dodgy, I can hold them for a few more rounds because they're. I don't have to play rookie roulette if you know what I mean. Um, so it keeps rookies off the field, so it's good. But it also means you probably have to use more trades to get to a full team maybe on the track. So pros and cons. Um, 
So. And then I guess that brings me up to, yeah, go on. So yeah, I don't think it, again, it's where you see the most value in terms of what the pick does for itself, because obviously rookies, you know, if, the, if your rookie fails and the mid price is going to win, because you've got to trade the rookie up. So for that reason, I think, I mean, obviously you want the rookies, even if the mid price makes less money than the rookie, um, I still think it, there's still a, a bit of value in the mid price. So I think it's fine. Um, but you consider points secondary, points and um, cash generation is almost secondary to the things like, like job security, where it's a prerequisite for everything else to take care of itself. And how many mid prices are too many? Would be my oh, thinking about. How many mid prices are too many? Yeah. Is um, there a certain number? Is it? So I think I've sort of answered this before. Um, because I mid could do a whole team of mid prices this year. Like I see so much value in mid prices. Obviously, that's not practical for super coach, but I guess where would you draw that line? Make sure you have 12 keepers. And then if you have that means you have three other mid prices, then that's fine. Four mid prices means you probably have 11 keepers. So you're really pushing it. You're gonna it's gonna, you know, the more mid prices you have, likely the more bust potential there is. Because historically, mid prices generally don't work. So I guess it depends on the context of every mid pricer. I can see the appeal. And there's a lot of talent out there, but at the same time, a lot of these guys aren't, you know, perfect picks because, you know, they're not in the right age bracket. Maybe they haven't done it for 22 games, if that makes sense. So, yeah, they wouldn't get too caught up in mid prices. I know it looks good and you can see it working, but having all of them actually work is another story. Yeah. So draw, draw the line after you have 12 keepers. If you start compromising on keepers, then it's going to be a long road to, you know, first of all, you have more mid prices, so more bus potential. And second of all, it's going to take longer to upgrade your team. So probably three max. Okay. Ideally less, but depends if they if you really believe in them or not. I might need to do some cutting back then, I think, with my team. So great yes. enough. Um. Okay. When in your mind for Supercoach, is it reasonable after round one or two to make trades? So when should or shouldn't you be making trades in terms of in round one and round two specifically? Okay, so the goal, the first few rounds, the goal is to save as many trades as possible. Maybe you have to jump on some players because they're um, just playing outstanding, the roles there. You know, maybe... I don't know, like Tom Green, for example, maybe he looks unbelievable. He's getting the most CBAs. It's kind of like your hands are almost forced. You kind of have to bring him in. So maybe you can find a way. But the goal is to save as many trades as possible early on. Um, sometimes you have to make corrections. That's fine. You just want to make sure that once you start doing upgrades, when your rookies start making money, which is round six or seven, you don't want to fall behind when doing upgrades. Because if you sideways a premium, Instead of doing a one up, one down, you're doing probably a one down and a sideways. So now you have one less, one less premium than everyone else. And that accumulates because you, um, you're probably losing 50 points a week because you have an extra rookie on the field. So then everyone else, everyone else has an extra premium. So in the first five rounds, do whatever you want. Um, try and save trades, but it's not going to hurt you too bad if you do a few sideways trades. Um, too many will hurt you later in the season, but it won't hurt you in terms of and not being behind in upgrades. So the goal is yeah, early on, try and get the right rookies. If you have to use a few extra trades, you kind of have to, but don't don't start trading sideways after five or six, round six or seven when you start upgrading because it's pretty much pretty much going to lose. And the harsh reality is if you get an injury in round six, round seven, and you fall behind straight away on upgrades, your season's almost done. And that's a bit annoying how that is, but it's just how it is. And is there a suggested range of trades to make in the first five rounds? So roughly how many would you advise, just I guess as a rough guide, assuming all's going okay, I suppose. Well, what would you be looking to do in that first five rounds? Is it just none if possible? So, I mean, again, it's the same goal. Save, save as many trades as possible. Mm. Um, I would try, so say round six is when you start upgrading. That's when I think that's 10 trades. 
nobody's um i can't remember if it's 10 or 12 trades but say say the first six rounds you got 12 trades try and save six Oh, fantastic. Yeah, because trades, you can get a big advantage from extra trades. It's more more rookies coming in. Um, maybe you can trade out a premium during the buy, which is not ideal, but trade out a premium because a buy who would otherwise cost you 100 points because you only have 18 players playing in the buy rounds where you get the 18 best scores. So an extra 100 points there just from, from that extra trade, which you wouldn't have had if you... Um, Made your starting team a little more, a little bit more reliable. Okay. Excellent. And what should I target? What should I target to become a good super coach trader? Should I be going after points, break evens, trading for intrinsic value? Which for you is more important? I think you look at the premium. Um, it helps. It helps if there's there's a lot of reliable types out there. So, you know, in defense, you can start them or you can upgrade to them. Like, for example, in the forward line, um, there's a lot of players that have been proven, and the proven players are probably the most they're the most reliable traders. So, you know, I'm already planning, I'm going to bring in Dustin Martin at some point. I'm going to bring, bring in Danger Group at some point. But then there's a players that might have a small sample size. They're playing really well, but then they haven't done it before. So it makes it a little hard and a, and a little risky. So just make sure the talent is there, the role is there, the job security is there, the durability is there early in the season. Um, but yeah, they're in the right age bracket as well. So there's sometimes, that's the thing in Supercoach, there are outliers and sometimes you get tricked into a player that's not as good as you thought. But outliers do happen where, you know, they go against the fundamentals, if that makes sense. Like Clayton Oliver in his second year, you can, it's almost impossible to predict that. So for him, a second year player to go 110 because... It's so uncommon. So how are you supposed to know? Um, but yeah. even like McRae a few years ago. So McRae, when he broke out, he was averaging like 130 in the first six rounds. And I'm thinking 130 in the first six rounds from McRae. We didn't see any signs of this in the preseason. Just wait for him to come down. And then he started going bigger and bigger and bigger. And averaged, he's averaged in the next three rounds. I think his three round average was like 170, 180. And his average was 140. And I'm thinking, oh, this is actually real. I thought he was going to come down. He's actually a 130 average player, which he turned out to be just about. Um, I think he had one injury that year, so he dropped down to like 125 or something. Um, so it's, it's hard to tell at times, but generally go with the safer guys, the more proven guys. Um, with the unproven guys, just yeah, go through the checklist. Role, job security, talent, um, durability, see how you go. And is it more, I guess, going after the likely, I guess, who will average more? Or is it about finding someone a bit more under price? Or I guess, how do you weigh that dilemma there? Like, how do you know who you should be targeting? Like, obviously, you've mentioned you want that proven durable guy. But I guess, is it more so going after, I guess, that guy who's a little bit cheaper and a little more affordable to save your trades, perhaps? Or is it about getting that definite, say, top eight mid or top six forward or defender? How do you weigh that equation, I suppose, in your mind when trading? Yeah, so I think it's like the stock market, I guess, buy low, sell high if you can, um, or by any sort of market, really. It's hard because sometimes you need to bring in cheaper players, and they're cheaper for a reason. Maybe they've been tagged a bit, maybe they had an injury, um, maybe they had a role change or something in the season, I don't know, just an example. So. When you go for cheaper guys, it's fine, but you just have to make sure you're not compromising too much on quality because you know, last year, for example, uh, I think Jack Martin was really cheap. Um, over 10 games, he was averaging 90 something, but he didn't have a super coach friendly role, but he was still averaging 90. So playing half forward, a little bit of mid time. But then what happened later in the season, not only did he get injured, so durability was bad. Um, that's part of the reason why he's, had, he's been cheap at the start of the year, but his role wasn't perfect either. So he got found out um, as a pick and yeah, played really poorly at the, the back half of the year. Um, so the money is sort of secondary to everything else, to making sure it's a good pick. But sometimes your hand is forced and by saving trades early, um, your hand won't be as forced going for cheaper players. So put yourself in a position if you can to not be in that position to go for cheaper guys. 
but yeah, sometimes if the price is right. I mean, one of the big things is, unfortunately, part of Supercoach is when a player gets concussed early in the game and then they come back in two weeks, their price has dropped significantly, but they're still a good pick, so they've got concussed, they had to go off. That's the, those are the players you really jump on. So Bailey Smith last year and Tom Stewart, the low 400s, so that's pretty pretty obvious selections. So, yeah, again, you just got to make sure the player is good, has the role, etc. And money is not as important as uh, making sure the player is actually a good a good stock. Excellent. And what's your opinion on chasing break evens in premiums in mid prices? Is that something we should be doing or considering? Try that again. What's your opinion on chasing break evens in premiums? In oh, okay. Mid uh it's fine it's a similar principle applies where i mean if you think you're going to get a player cheaper the next week it's fine but sometimes they might hit that break even and something sometimes other things might happen as well so you might get an injury and you thought you wouldn't get that player this week and because you went for the break even something happened you couldn't get it maybe another option pops up so i think it's fine to wait for break evens but uh, probably break chasing break evens i think it's more of an AFL fantasy thing um, but yeah, don't be afraid to go for a player with a big break even if you know they're a good player. Just um, yeah, just because sometimes leaving things leaving things to timing um, it can yeah, it's just not good leaving things to timing sometimes because things get out of your control. You want to keep the game in, in, you want to be in control as much as possible by picking durability and um, that sort of stuff, etc. So yeah, prices and everything. So yeah, uh, good game. Then. But yeah, okay. yeah, it's cool, yeah. And then I guess when should we or shouldn't we be chasing break evens in your view? Um, like, is there a rough? I wouldn't even be chasing break evens to be honest. I guess when a when a rookie has gone too um, up too much in price, then it's you know he's had a big score, but his break even is still good. But bringing bringing in an expensive rookie. Is makes makes things a little difficult later on. Um, might delay an upgrade for you. So, um, I guess if the play is too good to pass up, so the break even is like two hundred. Okay. Even so like well, that's the sort of quality of player, I suppose. And then if it's a rookie that's going to go up a whole heap, then you sort of go that route. Then, basically. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Interesting. And how much do buys matter for a starting super coach team if you're going for overall price? And make sure you make a move at all the board for game again. Yeah. Um, buys matter a little bit. They matter more towards the buy rounds. So round six, round seven, that's when you've got to really be aware. Um, but yeah, they do. Make sure you don't have 10 premiums in the same buy round. Definitely. So uh, not you know, if you have seven, then I guess it's okay. Uh, you can kind of work around it. But if you have eight, you're really pushing it. Although I have gone through firearms with eight players out and it worked out not too bad. Um, nine is a big, big problem. So make sure you don't have seven or eight in the same buy round. And as you're leading, as you're going towards the buys, I know the question was on the starting team, but try and figure out which rookies the which rookies can be held over the buy rounds, depending on when they have that buy. But you're into the starting team for rookies, it doesn't really matter. It's mostly just be aware of your premiums. No more than eight, ideally seven in the same way around. Usually the ideal time to, I guess, get rid of those rookies while you're talking about rookies. Like, is it when they hit a certain break even? Or I guess, when do you decide, I guess, when to keep them over the buy period or how, I guess, to work all that? So is it usually um, like when they hit a break even, they won't hit? Or is it sort of you trade them before they, I guess, hit that sort of, I guess, mutual break even, or I guess how you that, move them, the rookies. It does depend on the situation. So if there's more really, really, really good rookies coming in and you have saved some trades, you can afford to cut rookies early. Um, but if they're a really good on-field option, I guess you can hold them for a bit longer. And it depends what premium you can get to. If there's a premium with a really high break even and um, that you think that you really want to get this week, even though your rookie has more money to make, you can just make the trade. So it just depends on the situation. Don't be afraid to cut rookies early, I think. Okay. But yeah, probably they need at least three or four rounds most of the time. 
Yeah. Okay. And you're not too worried about sort of maxing their scoring and break evens. It's just moving and you're not sort of doing what they need to, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. pretty much. Okay. And if you had to lock in any one player for your super coach team for the next five years, who is it and why? Uh, good question. The obvious one is Matt Rao, I suppose. Did you say the next five years? Yeah, next five years. So, yeah. I needed him um, every year for the next five years. I suppose yeah. Grundy would be like, I think Grundy's like 27, 28, I'm not sure. Yeah, so he's born oh, in. Um, I think you've got to go with Clayton Oliver. Clayton Oliver, okay. So you've got the durability, he should still be around then, yeah. Okay. I think he's 23. I can't believe he's 23, to be honest. But, um, yeah. Nice yeah, good. Okay. That's a good choice. And for the purposes of a Super Coach Keepers League, because I seem to have attracted quite a few Keepers League sort of people, who would you take first and why? So I guess this is for like a dynasty going forward for a long time. Who would be, I guess, that first pick for you for the purposes of like a Super Coach? You've got them for the career, I suppose. So with, I've never played Keepers League. I'm not a draft person. Um, but my view on Keepers League is I would tank for like three years and try to win a flag then. So I would go for someone very young. It's probably Matt Rowe. Okay. Yeah, sounds Even like, if, if Matt Rowe's not available, we'll go for like a Walsh or a Green, mm. I think. Yeah. Or even like, a, I guess the next best Ruckman coming on is probably Ron Marshall. It's a good secure Ron. And with Once a Marshall, he's actually not as young as you'd think. He's actually only one year younger than Grundy, believe it or not. And really? And Kylie O'Brien. So you'd, you'd be thinking, oh. they've only just come good now, but they're actually older than you'd think. So um, that's well, what I like with the Ruckman, where it's like, well, if you had to take one Ruckman to go forward for the next 10 years, who would you take? Well, the options are pretty limited, really. So particularly in those that are really established and good footballers at the moment. So... Um, That's a hard question. For Ruckman, probably Draper, but he's got a lot of durability issues, so I'd have to have a really yeah. look at that one. I'm not sure. Mm, yeah. Mm, okay, and then... Yeah. And do you have a rule against premiums who have only done it for one year? So examples there would be guys like Steele and Petraka this past year. So do you approach these types with any, I guess, conservatism? And if so, to what extent? This is a really hard question yeah. um, because I don't look at it from a perspective of oh, they've only had one year for most of the time. Unless I don't have, I can't get enough info on them. I kind of look at what they're like off the field. So I, Jack Steele is such a hard worker. He sets the standards for so long. And he's a little bit more proven because when he wasn't tagging, he averaged 110 by other season. Um, I think it's just making sure that they've had a really good preseason, still got the role, still in the right age bracket. Um, so right age bracket, I mean, probably uh, 23 or 29. So I don't really have a rule against it, to be honest. As long as they're in the right age bracket and you know, the role is there, job security is there, um, no one's coming to take that, take that role away from them or that might impact that too much. Uh, no, I don't have a rule against it. One year only. Yeah. Uh, like in theory, I guess it could be the first of many, and we just haven't sort of seen that. But yeah, you're right. With like a skill and the track, or will you be assuming they continue in those roles anyway? Of okay. course, you've got to make sure they're having a good preseason, of course. So that should keep it in good stead, that, those sort of picks. Yeah, yeah, no, great advice there. And I guess for some player specific questions. So for you, is Callum Mills a top eight scorer in defense this year? It's, it seems like he's got that midfield role change. He was good as a junior, as a mid, but of course at AFL level, we've predominantly seen him in defence. But reports from trial game were positive. So what's your feel there? Can he be that top eight scorer? I feel like you would answer this question a bit better, but I'll give it a go. Yeah. So I watched him, I watched the first half of the Sydney Giants game, which is all I've seen of Callum Mills in the midfield. I think he had seven to 17 disposals for the game, seven tackles in a wet game. Okay. I was impressed with him. He's quite, he's taller than I thought, so that definitely helps. Um, 
Yeah. Pretty good at winning contestable innings. In the Sorry, say that again. He's just short of that 190, so he might be about that sort of 188 ish thereabouts. So, sorry, what were you saying then? Well, I think I was just looking at him as a player, and what I noticed is he's really good in close, I think. Mm. Um, and he's, his running pattern seemed pretty good. So, he was getting from stoppage to stoppage to stoppage. He wasn't always getting the ball, but it seemed to be a lot, a lot of the time I noticed his opponent was trailing him um, when getting some, uh, in terms of like his work rate on the ground. Which I was really impressed with. So that's a really big one. Yeah. So I definitely think he can be a top eight. Mm. Um, but again, it's like the Jake Zebul scenario, right? I know um, Mills has played midfield as a junior, but we haven't seen him in the midfield at AFL level, and we haven't really seen Zebul in the halfback at AFL level either. So that little that hint of unknown is kind of bothering me a little bit. But at the same time, if he goes back to defence, if it doesn't work out. He probably he scored okay 20 in 2020. So I think it'll be because he's such a high pick, he's played midfield as a junior. Um, I think I think definitely he'll be around the mark. But there is that unknown, which makes me a little bit hesitant. So, like for example, Caleb Daniels around the same price, and he's been a hundred average for two years. So a little bit safer, maybe less upside. So I think Mills is pretty durable as well, which kind of helps. So I think it's probably so, more of an upgrade think, target for you at this stage, would you be saying? Well, the problem is this year is there's no there's no defender rookie. So I'm actually thinking about it. Um and actually I, that's the line I'm probably finding it's hard to pick defenders. Like I'm actually finding the mid prices and premiums, there aren't as many relative to the other positions. Like all you've got all these really underpriced forwards, sort of sub three hundred. It's incredible. Or I could fill a whole team with yeah. them sub 300 forward it's remarkable and then yeah, you've, yeah. Got, you've still got enough rookies but yeah in defense it's sort of like i wish i didn't have to pick as many defenders so it's um yeah it's an interesting line for me there too yeah i've seen zebo f1 in some teams and i'm not going to tell them otherwise i think it's it's a little risky but I, I get it i understand it there's a lot of players in that lower lower bracket with really good job security and scoring potential there mm. okay and these are sort of, I guess, how much do they need to average questions? So yep. Sam Walsh, how much does he have to average to be worth picking this year? So it's not, I guess, you don't have to say how much they, they will, you think they will score. It's more, I guess, how much do they have to score to be worth picking, to be a bit more specific for all these guys. So is I mean, you're thinking I have between two games. Yeah. So with me, I have my I have given a bit of leeway to points. So I would say 105. Yeah. Some people would, would want more, mm. um, even a little bit less, like 103, 104. But again, the, the value is in durability, job security, role, all that. So um, and he's cheaper, it's cheaper starting price. Okay. So 105. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Next one I've got is Jai Simpson. So what would he have to average to be worth this year? So he's a little bit cheaper, um, probably um, probably 100. Yep. Matt Rowell. Same price, so 100. Okay. Tom Green. I like this one. Oh, I think you're picking him as a keeper, so 95. Oh, it's a hard one. He's a really, really awkward price. Is you take 95 as a keeper, but in the midfield, you're probably going to lose 15, 10 points a game yeah. uh, later in the season. But 95 to 350k, you're going to earn those points back in the early half of the season. So I'm going to say 95, and you can keep it at, keep him at an eight. And for me, funnily yeah. enough, that's for me possibly around, if he's assuming he's playing mid all year, I think that's almost his over-under average, funnily. So um, that could be nice. Okay. What about a Jackson Haitley? What would he need to average to be worth it? About the same, would you say, given similar price? So I think because Haley is cheaper, I think it's a little bit more leeway. So probably like 85 because you're going to trade him anyway. And the thing with Green is you can't trade Green during the buy rounds because he has the early buy, whereas Haley has the last buy. So it's a bit easier to flip him over, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it does. Great but Haley, unfortunately, is... I'm not sure he cemented his spot just yet, so I don't think he can pick Haley. Mm -hmm. I thought he would, but we'll see how he goes. 
Yeah, and I think midfield's his best spot as well. And look, he can play a bit of wing, a bit of half back. You can put him in half forward if you need to. So it'll be interesting to see how he's used. But I, from watching him as a junior, having watched a fair bit of his footy, I thought probably inside mid's his best spot. What about a James Harms? What would he have to average? So these are all guys I'm sort of considering that aren't necessarily committed to. So, And I guess having the insight as to what they would need to average would definitely help me in picking what are these guys. So Yeah, so Harms probably 90 in defence. Okay. Um, but the thing with Harms is we're not going to see his mid-time with Viney and Brayshaw because they're injured right in the preseason. And I think they, they might be good to go round one. Yeah, and it so sounds like play a bit of a mid half forward role from what I can gather. So, yeah, yeah. But again, it's like even I'm not. Exa- I, I need to see it, and if I don't see it, then I don't want to take the risk. But he's a good player. Though. Yeah, he is. Yeah, and particularly when he's more off the field rather than off half back. What about a Hayden Young? What would he need to average at his price point? Again, he could get kick out, so he's someone I'm giving some consideration to. So, what would he need to average? To be worth picking. So, is that so he's the last two seven nine? I think for me. Yes, I'm, I think I think he's about two eighty to me. Yeah, something around. So, that. I think he probably eighty. I think eighty is fine. I'm not sure how. I think that would make him make a little bit over hundred k. I think. Okay. But again, you can keep him on the field for a long time. So, good job security. Plus, okay. bad alternatives in defense. So, I'll say eighty. Okay. Stefan Martin. He's like 34, I think. He's always been really fit. Uh, again, he's competing with, I suppose, it's him and Hickey in that, that sort of price range. So, yeah. Probably, probably 185, 80 because of the rucks than just everyone else does. Yeah, good one. Okay. So, next I had Jack Zebel. So, what would he need to average? To be worth say 75. Oh, okay. I think he can do that. So maybe he'll be in my team. Jai Caldwell. Oh, uh, good. Jai's a difficult one. I think you want 90. You'd want 90. Okay. Yeah. That's just past mark. So maybe 88, 89, I guess. But I kind of just want to hit that 90 mark. Hmm. Zach Butters. Zach Butters needs to be a keeper at that price, so he needs to be 95. Okay. What about Cam Raynon? Cam's an interesting one because he's all the talk in Brisbane and we haven't seen any of it, so it's mm. hard. We'll see one game of it. You want 400k, you want to keep it. That's too expensive for a stepping stone. Mm. Um, so what would he need to average? Oh, yeah. yeah. 95, I guess. 93. 95. Maybe. Yeah. I would say 95. Okay. Yeah. I'd say that's pretty unrealistic given his history. So oh, really? <laughs> Good to know. Um, yeah. Yeah. His, like if you compare his numbers to say a Dusty or a Petraka at the same age, his numbers are far below those guys. So I, I don't oh, really think if those numbers come in to be realistic. Okay. That's, but, that's, like, that's very good. good. Average. Yeah. Cross them off your list for me. Um, what about okay. a uh, what about a Jarman Impey? So you're looking at almost your sort of rookie-ish price. I don't know what you'd want to yeah. do. Jarman probably just 65. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think he's done about 70 before, so he could do that. What about a Paddy Dow? What would he need to average? Same price, so 65. Okay. Yep, yeah. again, very doable. Harry Schoenberg. I've watched a bit of Schoenberg and he's just not getting the mid-time at the moment. And I think he's about 300k. Yeah. Probably not seeing it with him just yet. Maybe randomly plays a lot better than he has in the Amy that is Amy game. But um for I think he is he 310, 330? I have to so look probably, up, honestly. So I think you say a little bit above 300. Mm. Uh probably 85 in the stepping stone. Okay. Maybe 80. Yeah. 80 years ahead. Okay. What about a Joe Danner here? What would he need to average? Oh, I'm really excited to watch Joe in full flight this year. Um, yeah. But I think... It's a great thing. In- like, that's the big thing. Yeah. <coughs> I think um, same with uh, the other 200k guys, maybe between 60 and 70, uh, 65 and 70. Okay. 
That's doable. Like he's had one season, I think, where he got 80 and then the others have all been sub 70. So, yeah, maybe as a 65 or 70, perhaps. So, so say you got 65 to 70 is good to go, you reckon? Uh, 75 for Joe, you mean? Oh, you, sorry, you want 75 from Joe to be worthwhile, did you? Oh, no, like 65 to 70, but yeah. I know he's done. Probably about his range that he'll score. So would that be enough for you to start him? Yeah, oh, he's in my team at the moment, yep. Okay, cool. Yeah, if that's enough, then yeah, that's not a bad one. What about a nap five? What would he need to average? So now we're into... I don't like nap five as a starting pick. Um, yeah, like I feel like he... I think, say he plays 19 games, probably needs to average 115. That's acceptable. That's the floor. Yeah. And would you say the same of Josh Kelly then? Because he's another where he's got probably similar durability, maybe he plays 19 ish. People take a few either way. I think Josh Kelly's going to kind of ruin Supercoach every year because he's going to threaten to average 120 every year and uh, the durability question mark is always going to be there so um he's very frustrating for the game i think but i think yeah 115 okay i think you can do, do more but yeah 19 games 115 absolutely no. okay and how many games would those guys need to average so both fife and kelly to be worthwhile for you to pick so if you were to identify the number of games what's that number well, when you look at what we have, we have Merritt, Oliver, Petrarca. These guys just don't miss games. Mm. So it's hard to say. 20, I guess. 19, 20. Yeah. Ideally, though, it's... Would rather go to Oh, fantastic. Okay. So now I'm on to some, I guess, general footy and list management questions. So I don't have too much here for you. So yeah. one player to start a team with, who is it and why? Oh, good question. Uh, Christian Petrarca. Yeah. Oh, and why? Um, yeah. Why Petrarca? Why do you like him? I just think he's just unbelievable in terms of just, I think, I feel he's unstoppable in the midfield and then he can go forward and kick goals. So, yeah, yeah just the burst. This, I think it's highest contested rate in the game. Mm. So, yeah, I'd, I'd say Christian Petrarca. He's a match winner, superstar. Yeah, no, I love his game as well because it's a bit like with a Dusty where he'll impact games midfield, forward. So being that dual position impact player, I believe that's big. Okay, so an underutilised player on a rival list you would trade for and feel would represent value in a trade? I think anyone that watches my channel will know this. It's Josh Dunkley. Hmm. Um, I think, yeah, any, any club that has a surplus of something, uh, go nuts at it. So I think um, Paul got Aaliyah for unders, in my opinion. Ready yeah. made kick from player from the pick 30s. I think it was his 2018 season he got something like, I think it was 91 marks from, it wasn't very many games, like it might have been 11 games or something. So, um, yeah, he's absolutely phenomenal. So, yeah. But yeah, definitely yeah, a people. Dunkley Even Bailey team. Smith and McRae had a contract. One of, some of them are going to be unhappy when they don't get the mid-minutes. Go for it. Yeah. Mm. I have to actually think about this chess move here. Okay. Um, okay, Premiership pick. Who would you pick for the flag this year? I will say that I'm not the greatest at predicting team wins because I just try to play this individually. Um, but I... Yeah, don't follow team play too much. Yeah. It's hard to go past the experienced teams, but I feel Brisbane are really ripe to go. They've had a bit of experience in finals. They got Joe now. Mm -hmm. Their in their prime. Harris Andrews is gun back there. So, yeah, I'll go Brisbane. Brisbane to beat Richmond. Okay. And the team that could rise from outside the top eight and break in, who in your mind is the most likely? And there's a number of teams that have a real hot shot, but you had to pick one from outside the eight last year. Who do you think might sneak in? I was thinking about this move. Uh, I think there's two teams. I know you you like Freeway. I think Fremantle or Melbourne. Yeah. You know, Melbourne with that midfield, and they got May and they got Brown now. There's no excuse for them, really. 
I feel like good ones underutilize that list. I don't know, but uh, when you have Gorn, Petrarca, Oliver, yeah, you got to do better than you got to make that eight with that team. He yeah. should have been second by now. But... Four in the past, so yeah, you never know. So yeah, Frio or Melbourne? I'll say Melbourne just because I love Petrarca and Oliver and Gorn, and they got Mays playing really well as well. Okay, fantastic. Um. Yep, so that's it for my questions. So let's see how we go with this game. This is our best one so far. So, okay. And then after this game, we'll get stuck into some of your questions, I think. Sounds good. I hate it when the Queen's in the back line. I just don't yep. know what to do. Yeah. When you've either got sort of a Rook or a um, Queen on the either second or seventh rank, respectively, it's a pig, it's known as, because it gobbles up all the pawns. So. And I'll, I'll just go to questions I think of top of mind. But if you had to say one midfielder, who would be the top scoring midfielder this year, do you believe? Um, so we obviously had Lockie Neal last year. My favourite player in the midfield is Jack Steele. I just think he just destroys his opponent every week, contests the ball, tackles, now he's kicking goals, takes contested marks. He's my favourite player. I hope it's Jack Steele. Mm. Um, but I think it'll be Lockie Neal again and Oliver will be up there it's easier to say the top three I guess but they've already shown they can hit 120 mm. near 130 okay. um, and do you think with him he's going to be like pure mid again because I heard some talk that he might even have a few minutes across half back and there was just some I don't know weird talks about him could any of that eventuate do you think or you don't I think that's just for rest a little bit yeah um, maybe they want to give Rainer and Bailey a bit more minutes and I don't think that'll be too much. Maybe he spends less time on the bench and more time at halfback. I'm not really worried about that. Okay. So, and then um, about a Jack McRae then. So, because obviously you've got such a glut of Bulldogs midfielders where it's just ridiculous. How oh, you... Jack McRae's a tough one. Mm. He's one of my favourites. Really sort of, I've struggled with both ways where his upside is, is high, if not higher possibly even than a lucky meal if he's to get the midfield minutes but of course well you've got so many and with the addition of Trelaw who is really a pure mid like you could play him on a wing as well but um yeah that's one I've really wrestled with quite a lot so yeah Jack McRae I don't think you can start him because again there's questions over the role mm. and but yeah he's the number he's a top two mid every every year if he gets the role but I'm not sure he gets it so um, yeah, I love Jack McRae, but it's it's hard to pick him this year. Maybe he drops back to low one tens, mm. but we'll see how he goes with the um, with the role. Yeah, no, good call. Um, so, you, are you thinking about starting McRae this year? I probably won't at this stage, given the exact reasons you mentioned. Just the role. There's just too much uncertainty. Like, how do you give them all minutes? Like. You've got Bond, who is really best as a mid. Like, people talk about him as a good forward, and he can play some forward. And I, I think he'll probably be forced to play a bit more forward this year. But I, I still don't quite think McRae will get as many inside minutes as he needs to be quite the scorer we want him to be. Like, when, when I pick McRae, I think he needs to be a captain option, but just given his price point. But, yeah, I think he probably, like a lot of the other mids, I suppose, I think he probably drops back a bit, but... Um, but yeah, that's one of the troubles I've been finding with all the premium mids this year. Like none of them, I feel, are priced appropriately. For me, they're all sort of overpriced with really almost every player feeling like last year was, by their previous scoring standards, almost an outlier, you could say. So um, yeah, the premiums are what cause me headaches. Rookies and mid-prices, I'm always very comfortable picking. But yeah, the premiums, it's just, yeah, that's a real source of frustration and yeah, probably a bit much overthinking, possibly on my end. So, but yeah, look, I'm okay. not ruling out. But a lot of these mids, I think, are like one A, one B, one C. So Petrarca, Steele, Oliver, Mera. That's probably my pool of four at the moment. So that's why I would pick from personally. But there's always other. Sometimes players break out a little bit. So 
never really know, but can't go wrong with those guys. Yeah. And with a merit, I guess, like, how high do you think he'll average? Will he just maintain his average? Like, he's durable, so, like, I get why you're picking him given his durability, but do you think he'll yeah. boost his scoring? Will it be about the same? He scores well on the inside and the outside. That's the thing. Yeah. Just because even if he's not in the balance, he'll follow up contests anyway. Yeah. So probably um, another, I don't know, low 110s, I reckon. Mm. Pretty improved much. He's, he deals with tags a bit better now. So maybe that helps. And for a GWS, who would you say takes the kick out? That's something that's really intrigued me quite a bit as well, where obviously Shaw's gone, Williams is gone. That GWS defence is just so shaky. It's, it's probably Whitfield when he comes back. Um, and then it'll probably be Ash or Cummings, or Cummings, I don't know which one it is. Yeah. Um, and then maybe Haynes takes a few as well. So I think it'll be shared. Yeah. But not sure. Maybe one of the Asian coming can play. I'm not sure they can both. I'm not really sure if Mel's at all. Mm. But I think we share a bit. Okay. And do you think there'll be much of an increase in, I guess, defenders scoring this year? Because I guess you've got the new play on rules that I guess may allow them to do more damage. Or will it mean, do you reckon they'll maybe chip it around a bit more? How do you think super coach scoring might be affected if at all? Do you have much of a feel there? I haven't taken much from the practice games. I haven't taken much notice, to be honest. But it feels like in your head it makes sense that the halfbacks who get the ball more, they use the ball well, and they can open up the angles. So that's Jake Lloyd sort of does that. Daniel does that. Not so much with the long kicks, but the angle kicks. Hmm. And then Jaden Short can go long or short as well. So yeah. I feel like those guys would get a bit more of the ball, but not exactly short. Okay. So I think there's a... We certainly wouldn't say it's less, but maybe they use these guys more up the ground. Mm. Um, I'm not sure. So I'm not, I'm not, at this stage, I'm not really considering it um, yeah. Yeah. too much. And how do you think a Sam Doherty will go this year? So obviously last year was his first year back after a little while off. How do you think he'll go? Is there going to be much of a change in his scoring from last year, or what's your feel there with him? Because he's someone I've found hard to get read on. Like he's had one year in the past where I think he was a one ten scorer thereabouts, or maybe it was even one fifteen. It may have even been a bit higher than that. I'm not really sure where all the points go with Saad and Newman back there as well. Mm. Yeah. So he has durability yeah. issues. He had. Did a calf last year and then um, had general soreness throughout the year. Mm. So it makes it kind of hard to pick him. Um, so I think, with, yeah, it's a durability factor. But the thing is, he's come off two ACLs and plays always underperform after, after they do an ACL, with the exception of Lenny Hayes, I think. So now he's had another, I think he had some surgery. He had like the cancer scare, but I think that's fine. Um, but yeah, prepared, came back really impressively after two ACLs, better than most people would. So I think he's actually an option because now he's had a proper preseason, unlike last year where you're just doing rehab and getting back into it. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, I think he's an option, but I think still two ACLs, did a car, even though he's having a better preseason, doesn't mean that the durability, the lack of durability disappears. So yeah. a little too risky for mine. Oh, is that hanging? Oh, no, it's not. That's right. I wasn't watching the chess game from one. I was thinking, what have you done? Okay. Don't want to lose the 600 even. Oh. Okay. Are you struggling with the boards this year at all in terms of premiums? Somewhat. Um, like at this stage, if I had say two um, forwards, it would be probably Dunkley, although I do have some reservations about his past durability. And then you've got Danger as well, where both really have, I guess, the 110 plus scoring upside. So, um, yeah, in terms of premium forwards, they're probably the two. 
But then I'm seeing all this value in terms of mid prices. And based on the feel you're giving me in terms of how much I guess they need to go up by an average, well, I, I could fill a whole front half with, I guess, those, I guess, high end rookie price, like all those, I guess, sub 250 ish general forwards and a few others that might be sub 300. And you could almost do a whole line with that. So, um, yeah, I guess that's something I'll have to work through. But yeah, I'd be comfortable probably at this stage, I'd say, with um, with Danger and Dunkley. They're probably my two. Side bottom, I've given some consideration to. Um, will I pick him, though? Probably not. I, I think he's just too overpriced. But I do think he'll be one of the top scorers. Marshall, it's a shame. I would have liked to have had him. But um, yeah, it's not looking like that's going to be possible anymore. Um, to think through this move quite a bit as well. Let me get out of that. Yeah. What I have to watch here, I need to avoid a back rank. So. To place I've got them. a few things in the reasonable position here. Yeah, I think. Yeah, no, you're playing a good game. So, <laughs> you've got the chance to cause some problems here. Yeah, great move. I don't like your queen though, that's kind of scaring me. Like, well, it's going to gobble everything up. Yeah. Yeah, the queen doesn't have any immediate threats, so you're safe from that. The thing you need to watch for is um, the pin, my rook is going after your queen if the knight moves. So that's the one thing to, in this position, be really watchful. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, it's a pinned piece. So if, you, if I was to say to you, who would be the top eight scoring midfielders, who would they be this year? I did a video on this, and I, I've kind of revisited it a little bit. Yeah. My top three was Neil, Steel, Oliver. Yeah. I have Jake still second. I have, look, there's, bias gets in the way sometimes, but hmm. when there's a, what you want, a 1A, 1B scenario, it's go with a heart over the head. So yeah. Jake still second, Oliver third. Um, yeah, you're in a critical position and there's a chance that, I don't know if you can win it, win it, but you may be able to draw it. Maybe you can win it and I haven't looked closely enough, but, um, I think fourth is, I have Petrarca, I, Petrarca looked unbelievable. Again, some questions over his tank. Okay. Um, oh yeah, I really liked Petrarca's game. Yeah. Uh, um, fourth Petrarca. I didn't have Mera in, but I actually have him, have him in now. And I kind of put him in because I know you were talking with Selby about it, as how in April Fantasy he had um, Mera projected as number one. Coming yeah. into the right age bracket. And, like, oh, gee, better pay attention. So have him then. Okay. Because I've actually currently got merit in my fantasy, but not my super coach currently. He's in consideration for super coach, but um, but yeah, I find him more of a fantasy scorer just because I guess he's lower volume contested. So um, like he's had a number of years in fantasy where I think he's even got that sort of one fifteen mark. So coach, um, I think he's usually scoring a little bit below in what he would in fantasy, whereas most would on average score a little bit higher in super coach normally. So um, therefore I put a little less weight into that. Oh my God. I am. Yeah. Oh, you've actually played a really good move here. So I'm actually able to do that and now you're a rook up. So now it's, yeah, I'm playing the draw pretty much. So yeah, you've 
play fantastic. And yeah, my <laughs> rating is going to get ruined, but so. <laughs> well, I think it's unranked, so it should be right. No, this one's ranked. So yeah, if you win, you'll boost something. I'll, if I draw, it's minus 347. <laughs> so that's a bit of a worry. And then if I lose, it's minus 694. So. So I think they're at fifth, and then I had Bond and McCray next. Yep. Okay. So, okay. Uh -huh. And do you think Bond's going to play enough um, midfield time to be what you want him to be? Like, will he, I guess, score enough? Or will, I guess, will he lose that many midfield minutes that he won't score it, or will he, I guess, keep those midfield minutes. Rough. He's playing a lot forward mm. right now. Yeah. Uh, he was the number one midfielder then last year. Yeah. So can I win with just a rook and a king? You can. Yep. You'd have I to know. know after that. <laughs> <laughs> but you can absolutely win with a rook and a king. So what you'd need to do, you'd need to get me onto either the back line or one of the side lines. So if it was to get to just Rook and King against King. They were good for that. Yeah. I should have spent less time looking at my questions and more time. <laughs> yeah. That's it's hard to concentrate because you're trying to do two things at once. It's mentally challenging, I think, but it's hard. I have done well. Playing a good game. I think I'm going to draw this and accidentally kill my pawn. Yeah. I mean, I'll use my king, I suppose. So there we go. So yeah, Bond McRae, there, six and seven. And then eight, I actually had Matt Crouch, but not anymore because he's injured. Uh, you know who's a really big smoky? Mm -hmm. Andrew Brayshaw. Andrew Brayshaw, okay. Mm. So Andrew Brayshaw's set amounts of distances and time on ground were quite terrible, but his points per minute were really high last year. Still averaged 100. Yeah. Um, so, there's upside with more CBAs. He got, in, in the trial game, he got uh, 21, I think, he had, no, I think it was 19 CBAs and the next person had like 13 or something. So he had the most CBAs by far. So there's clear upside with more time on ground and more CBAs in duration. He's in my AFL fantasy team, but I'm not taking because I care less about AFL fantasy. Yeah. Um, but I'm not taking that risk. Okay, I'm going to stay away with the I? Yeah, so you have to make sure that my king always has one space to move if you're going to get the W here. So it's either go for checkmate or make sure. Yep, stay away. Oh, no. <laughs> Yeah, almost. Uh, that's fine. That's a bit easy on your rank. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I can't believe that. Yeah. <laughs> Mate, you've done well to get to here, so well done. My rating oh, taken God. one big hit, so yeah. I can't believe I did that. Oh, that's a lack of experience. Yeah. Yeah, I what you that. do is basically get the king involved, ensure that, I guess, you can promote the pawn to... Um, E8 and yeah, supporting it and making sure my king always has somewhere to move. It's more you'd want to force the king to sort of D8 then to C8 and then you can use the king to help the pawn progress up. Yeah, so sure. Yeah. I, got, I got greedy and I tried to end it quicker. Yeah. Um, no, well, for the game. It's a good game and but I know we played a few times before and those were all slaughters. So unfortunately, the one that got close was on camera. Yeah, almost. But, um, I think I need to get back into practice. I'm too far removed from chess. So, yeah, thanks for getting on the stream today, George. And um, yeah, make sure you get behind Super Coach George. I'll link his channel in the description below. And um, yeah, thanks, guys. See you in the next video. Thanks, Chris.